On today's Tech Tuesday, we're going to talk about individual throttle bodies. Do they actually work? If so, why and how? And is it hard to tune them? So if you've been to any sort of car show and peeped under the hood of an old school classic race car, you've probably seen this sort of thing. It's an intake manifold with individual throttles for every cylinder, or ITBs for sure. Now, these things normally have some sort of trumpet looking arrangement bolted to the top, or more technically these trumpet things are called velocity stacks. There's a reason for that, which we'll get to in a minute. But for now, let's get back to these intake manifolds. The alternative to these ITBs is a single throttle body arrangement with a plenum chamber, like you'd see on most engines out there. Now, if you've got a GTR Skyline or an M3 BMW, you might be lucky enough to be really confused and have both ITBs and a plenum. But that combination is actually pretty rare. Most of the common styles of intake manifolds you'll see with these plenum style setups with a single throttle body at the front or on the side. And there's good reason for this. They're really simple and they're cheap to build. And really, they've proven to be super reliable over the long term. So if these single throttle body units are really good setups, why do we have these ITBs at all? Well, my personal opinion on this matter is we have them because they look so damn good. I mean, whoever opened up the engine bay and saw a nice, clean, polished set of ITBs with velocity stacks sitting in there and thought to themselves, meh, like that plenum better? Nope, no one, no one ever said that. But apart from looks, do ITBs actually give us a performance gain of any sort? Well, the answer to that one is sometimes, or more appropriately, when designed and implemented correctly, individual throttle bodies should and will give you increased horsepower, but they do come with their limitations. And truthfully, in my experience, most of the time these throttle bodies look better than they perform. All right, so that's a big statement. So let's look at the theory behind an individual throttle body setup and we'll get to the bottom of how to extract the most out of them and why sometimes they're not that good. The idea behind having a throttle body for each intake runner is simple enough. As RPM increases, a single throttle body is often not large enough to allow enough airflow through to keep up with the entire engine's airflow demands. And when this happens, what you actually see is the engine starts to pull vacuum on the intake manifold pressure sensor as the RPM goes up. So here's the first piece of advice for you. If the pressure on the intake side of your throttle body starts to fall off at high RPM versus the atmospheric side of the throttle, or if it's a turbo engine, if there's a difference in boost pressure between before the throttle and after the throttle, then your throttle's a restriction to engine airflow, and you'd be well served by increasing the size of your throttle body. But here's the kicker. The inverse is also true. If the throttle body is not acting as a restriction to airflow at high RPM, then there's little to no gain in replacing it with a bigger one. All right, so let's assume you're in a situation where your stock throttle body is actually a restriction to your engine's airflow, and at wide open throttle, high RPM, you do see vacuum in the intake manifold. So you decide you do indeed like the look of these individual throttle bodies, so you buy a set, you bang them on your engine, will you automatically just make more horsepower everywhere all over the RPM range? Probably not. Here's why. Remember that your original throttle was totally capable of supplying enough air at the lower RPM ranges. It's only once the RPM really got up there that you started to see the vacuum in the intake manifold. At all RPMs below that, the factory intake and the throttle was perfectly adequate. So at best, the ITP setup will replace the original single throttle body, but up until the point where it started pulling vacuum and it was actually a restriction, it's only from that point onwards where there's any potential to increase the airflow and make more power. And this would be all there is to it if it was simply the size of the throttle and that was the only thing that affected the amount of air entering your engine. But that's not the case. Because air has a mass and we're moving it from one place to another, that is from outside of the engine to inside of it, then we need to build up some sort of air speed. But the air speed we're building up isn't constant. You see, it pulses as the intake valve opens and as the piston moves down at stroke and then it closes the valve again, that air speed increases and then decreases. 
And then when the valve is actually closed, the air in the intake actually kind of bunches up like a spring. And then it bounces back out of the intake and it sets up these sorts of pressure waves in the intake manifold. Now, these pressure waves can actually be used to our advantage with good intake design, of course. Or with poor design, they can make the world a pretty miserable place for us. So just remember back to what I call those trumpet looking things on top of your ITBs, the velocity stacks. Well, the reason they're called velocity stacks is because they're actually critical in building up air speed or air velocity. So a lot of complex mathematics aside, the longer and the narrower the stack, the higher the air speed that is generated on the intake stroke. Like think about it as a column or a spring of air that's being sucked into the engine. When you close the intake valve, that column compresses up and then it shoots back up the intake runner. Eventually, it'll hit the top of the intake plenum and then it'll bounce back down the runner. And if you open the intake valve at just the right time, you can actually stuff the slightly compressed column spring of air into the combustion chamber. Now, as RPM increases, the amount of time the intake valve is open decreases time, not percentage of crank rotation, but time. And as the piston moves down the ball faster, it creates a higher pressure differential across the valve. And as a result, the length of the velocity stack required to create and catch that slightly compressed spring of air decreases with RPM, which is exactly why if you look at some of those really high-end racing engines, you'll see that the velocity stacks on your individual throttle bodies are actually fully variable with RPM. They go up and down as the RPM goes up and down. Now that's probably a bit extreme for most of us here, so we need to make a choice. Short runners are really good for high RPM, but that comes at the expense of low RPM torque. The converse is true as well. The longer runners will produce more torque at low RPM, but they run out of puff at high RPM. Pick your poison, I guess. All right, so length is important, but what about girth? Does the actual diameter of the runner and the throttle matter? Well, in short, yeah, it does. There is such a thing as too big, it turns out. So one of the common problems with all individual throttle body setups is just the smallest amount of throttle movement lets a really large volume of air into the intake runner. This makes the engine sound super snappy, but it can also make both driving and tuning the engine super difficult. So for the engine, it's a little bit like trying to drink from a fire hose. Two or three percent of throttle movement at low RPM can shoot the manifold pressure all the way up to atmospheric pressure, which effectively is like going full throttle which is actually probably the biggest challenge when tuning the fuel delivery on an ITB setup. Small amounts of throttle movement equal really large amounts of air, and the bigger the throttle, individual throttle you've got, the worse that gets. In fact, it's not uncommon to tune the fuel map of these ITB setups solely on the position of the throttle, and of course RPM, because they're so sensitive. Now, one of the challenges of doing this is if you don't have really good resolution on the throttle position sensor at that close throttle position, or perhaps the throttles don't always return to exactly the same spot, um, or if there's any noise at all in the electrical system on any of the sensors, then it becomes a real challenge to tune these things. So my personal recommendation when using an individual throttle body setup is to install a vacuum log. Now, this is just a hose or a tube that joins all of the individual throttle chambers into a single vacuum log. That has the benefit of both balancing the subtle differences between each throttle, and don't even get me started on balancing eight of these things. If you know, you know. If you don't, well, be glad you don't. Uh, it also gives you a decent manifold pressure signal that can be used to tune the fuel and the ignition maps. Of course, because there's likely still going to be significant air pressure pulsations at idle, it's commonplace to turn on the zero throttle map or the zero demand table in the ECU, which gives you a totally independent fuel map and ignition map for when the throttle is closed. This gives you just a little bit more consistency and resolution when dialing in the idle air fuel ratio than using the map signal that's bouncing all over the place at low RPM. Yeah, it's kind of complex. So, individual throttle bodies. Are they worth it? Well, like most things in life, it depends. 
On the positive side, there's no doubt a well-tuned ITB setup sounds amazing. They can be crisp, snappy, and a thing of beauty to look at. If you've taken the time to match the length of the velocity stack with the camshafts and all the other engine mods, they can also add significantly to your engine performance. Now, however, if you are thinking of just bolting up any old set of manifolds that'll fit to your engine and then turning the horsepower to the moon, think again. ITB setups can be a fickle beast, and to be honest, I see more people go backward with aftermarket ITB arrangements than forwards. Now, if that didn't confuse you enough, we have a question that's come through the socials. Big Bot Hoey? Big Bot Ho? Big Bot asks, where in the NSP software do you change the injector size? Well, Big Bot Ho, unlike choosing whether to upgrade your ITBs, that question is easy to answer. The injector flow rate in NSP is found under the fuel tuning node in the software. You go to stage one and then flow. Of course, if you've got two or three stages of fuel injectors, when you turn on secondary injection in the main setup page, a stage two and a stage three, etc., will show up here in the fuel tuning node as well. <laughs> now, I'm sure that video is gonna have a whole bunch of questions. So if you do have questions about this video or anything else, please drop them in the comments below or head on over to our web page and check out the new and updated knowledge base, which is full of helpful articles on how to get things done on your engine using Howtech Electronics. Also, don't forget to ring the bell here on YouTube to subscribe for all of our latest videos. And of course, if you haven't already liked us on Facebook or followed us on Instagram or signed up to our newsletter, go ahead and do that right away. Well, I'm Matt from Howtech and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching guys. If you like this video, smash that like button. We put out a new video every week and sometimes even two. So don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more awesome content.